going to push on, and I'm going to introduce our next speaker now. I'm going to introduce uh, Philip. I'm going to go for it. Young blood. Young blood in our. But I'm getting wrong. I'll have just two seconds, Philip. I'll give. I'll give the young blood for you. Uh, since 2011, Philip has been executive director of the Advanced Centre of Regenerative Translational Medicine. His main areas of focus fall within the niche of thoracic. Is that right? Yes. Yes. Surgery and regenerative medicine. Uh, Philip has worked heavily on tissue engineering and cell therapy in lung diseases and is currently doing his research at the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm. Uh, his dis discoveries have been featured in a wide range of news articles, specifically after a successful operation on a two and a half year old uh, girl who was born without a winter pipe. The BBC has included the successful synthetic organ transplantation as one of the key events in Sweden's historic timeline. I am fascinated to hear what you've got to say, Philip. <laughs> Medicine or transplantation medicine, we have a dilemma which has existed since the very beginning. 
So on the one hand, you, you have a high demand of bone organs. So many people, many patients need bone need other, other game transplantation. That means you need a donor who gives the organ, and then you have a recipient who's waiting for this organ. You have this balance between the demand and then the shortage of so the numbers of people who really need their organs is very low to the numbers of the people who need an organ. And then if you're a lucky guy and you get an organ, you have the next problem, this is the organ rejection. So even if you match really perfectly with the donor, you always have this organ rejection. And then you need this immunosuppression for the rest of your life. And this means that you have a lot of complications due to this medication. It's a very aggressive medication. It's a lot of side effects, negative side effects. So this is a dilemma which has never changed. And at this stage, we try to, to make a new, open a new era of, of organ transplantation. And this tissue engineering concept, the main idea is that you provide, that you develop something that is not rejected by the body, but by the recipient. So what you have is the scaffold, the matrix, the basic structure. Then you have the cells that comes on top of the scaffold and the matrix. Then you put it all together in a bioreactor, and there the organ can grow, and the cells can differentiate, and then you add some molecules and differentiation factors and to make it becoming the real target organ that you're looking for. So we start with the scaffold. As I said, the main idea is to have something that is not rejected. You take the tissue, and then you wash out all the cells that are on this on this organ and that might be rejected by the recipient organism. And what you remain is a the extracellular matrix. This is a very very fascinating material, one can say, because this matrix holds a lot of information for the cells: where to go, where to migrate, how to proliferate, how to differentiate. All this information are inside this matrix. Um, if you have this one created, then you go on with the next component of your concept of tissue engineering, and that's the cells. So the question is, which kind of cells? So there are so many different cell types. You have the dull stem cells, you have embryonic stem cells that we do not want. If you're a uh, Catholic, of course you do not like these cells, but um, let's say we are in Great Britain, it's not a problem, right? Um, then you have the used fluid open stem cells, which are stem cells that are, you can take them from the skin and then you reprogram them and they become kind of embryonic stem cells. So you have a lot of options. The question is always, what is your target organ? What are you looking for? And then you choose a specific and the ideal cell type. And then you go on, you have bioreactor, which looks pretty simple, but it can look very complex as well. The most important is that you mimic the conditions of the organism where you're putting your tissue later on. And then you have the signaling molecules, which are growth factors, or you give medications to the patients, where you mobilize specific cells from the bone marrow into the patient's bloodstream. So there are different options how you can improve your overall outcome after the transplantation. Or you can induce the differentiation of the cells that you put in your scaffold. So this is the which is quite new and there's a lot of space and a lot of um, unknown, unknown mechanisms and pathways that, that is the next promising area, I guess, in medicine. So here you can see the concept. In general, we take the tissue from a, from a dead person. In our case, we took the, the tra trachea, we take it out, and then you have these washing steps where you use some solutions and you wash out all the cells that might be rejected or might be detected by the immune system of the recipient of the body. Then you take some bone marrow, you isolate the cells, and you grow your tissue on the same side. You add some factors to the construct that we prepared before. You can inject it into the scaffold, you can add it into the cell media, there are different options, and you grow everything, and you add the cells on top. This is a bone marrow. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Um, and then you, you wait, depending on how complex your organ is, you can implant it directly into the patient and it continues to develop and it continues to originate inside the body, or you have to wait for many weeks until the, the tissue is fully um, regenerated and uh, differentiated. So, all this uh, research led us to the first transplantation in 2008 in a patient. 
um, this is that we prepare the scaffold, this basic structure, and see the cells of the patient on top of it, and then we implant it into it. And this was a, a picture that some years after that, making a CT scan, and you could see that this area here was with like this, and this was a young lady who got this organ. She was a young lady suffering from tuberculosis, and um, her left main broke was the left and the right one that you have kidney, and the left side was completely blocked by the tuberculosis. And there was no other treatment choice for her anymore, except taking off the left lung. The left lung was just healthy, it's just the connection to the left lung was affected by the disease. So, um, in, with our method, we protected her from losing her left healthy lung. And now she's alive since five and a half years, and she's doing pretty well, and, um, and it's a completely different life. Before, she had just the option either taking off the left lung or get a transplantation, and then this is connected, as I said in the beginning, as is related to immunosuppression, which is not something you want to give to some young people and the mom of two children. Anyway, the problem of biological scaffolds is always that you still need a donor, so we do not really provide something new to the market, let's say. And the other problem is if you are talking about the longer segments, in the current case, we just replaced a short segment, but we transplanted other patients where we replaced the entire tract here. And as soon as you're talking about the long segments, then the mechanical properties is a real issue over the years and over time. So therefore, we need another solution for this kind of patients. And therefore, we went back to the bench, which we really came up in 2011 with another concept. So we tried some synthetic scaffolds. So this is a patient, a young man with a tracheal cancer, with a tumor in the middle of the, so this is the end of the trachea, and here comes the left and the right lung. You can see the opposite of these pictures. Um, and the tumor was just in the middle then. I mean, it was just blocking everything, and it was invading also in the, in the adjacent tissue. So this was not treatable with any normal, conventional, surgical um, treatment. So what we did, we, we used the CT skin of this guy, and then we rebuilt, based on the CT skin, we rebuilt his native trachea using a synthetic polymer. And this was developed together with a group from London. And then we seeded the cells on top, we implanted it. So this is CT scan after the transplantation. You can see it looks perfectly fitting into the surgical site. And this was a, a bronchoscopic view after, after the surgery. You can see it's open, it's open, it looks nice, and <laughs> it's good. Anyway, after a few months to years, uh, we were not that happy with the mechanical issues, with the mechanical properties of this, of this synthetic material. So we went back to the bench, and we tried something new. And finally, my favorite pet <coughs> soft drink into the place. So the pet is a polymer, polyethylene, and um, the question is how can you make something like this becoming a trachea or another organ? So if you look back to the biological scaffold, the biological trachea, the basic structure, not only the trachea, the basic structure in all tissues, it looks nearly the same like this. If you go very deep into the tissue, the nanostructure structure looks like this. So this is a native decellarized, so move out all the cells, trachea. And then if you try to think about something that looks exactly the same, we use this patch material and we use the method that calls electro spinning, where you actually can provide and produce very thin on large scale based fibers and then you can orientate them similar to the to the biological tissue. And then you can even add proteins. When you remember the beginning of the talk, I showed all these proteins that are remained and given information to the cells for the proliferate and differentiate. So you can put this on top as well. And then you can actually see how the cells migrate on this new material, and you can change the orientations of these fibers, and changing the orientation, you also change the speed of migration, and you also change the differentiation. If you make a lot of tension on each fiber, then you get strong and like bone or cartilage. If you make very soft fibers and the tension very low, then you get like more fat adipose tissue. So, this is the cell, and they communicate very well in this material. They migrate very well, they adhere very well. And we, we learned that if you not only look to the protein level of a, of a tissue, but also the 
basic structure. This gives a lot of information to the cells, and it's at, at least as critical as the proteins <coughs> if you go on and on to develop a new organ. So in 2013, we had this new version of, of a scaffold where we found epithelial cells. This is an epithelial cell that's lining the trachea on the inside. This is a new graft. Here is a native trachea. And all this that's coming now is a new created trachea in this patient. So we think that we found a very nice solution, a very ideal the native trachea mimicking solution for this kind of disorder. Um, <coughs> we now currently, we're back in the, in the lab, and we try to transfer the same concept to other organs, to other tissues. Um, but we are not the only one, of course, and we did not develop an entire method of tissue engineering, but, um, but we brought it together with other groups like uh, Tony Attala, Laura Nicholson, or Doris Taylor. We brought it very close to the clinic or into the clinic. And I mean, of course, there are many people around the world who help us, and uh, we work together and get inspired and get new ideas how to, to overcome drawbacks and the hurdles and, and so on and so forth. So it's a global issue and it's a global um, project, but um, um, we show that things that um, used to be described as science fiction or not possible or, or probably possible or maybe you can get this result, that result, you don't know how can you put in a patient. At some stage you have to stop this discussion and, and just make the step. And um, this guy, the former President from the United States, who's um, well, I have been known to make um, interesting comments. Let's say um, in 1998, he made a pretty, I mean, confusing, still confusing, but kind of smart sentence. So what he said was, "It's a lot of speculation. I guess it is going to continue to be a lot of speculation until the speculation ends." <laughs> <laughs> so I mean. Thank <laughs> you.